All right, so we're gonna we're gonna shift from this dramatic particle in a box uh, potential energy surface, which has straight up walls that go to infinity, and we're gonna go to a par parabola. Okay, but vibrational motion is still like a particle in a box. It's still one dimension, even though the whole molecule may be bending, and there's lots of masses moving. You can treat it as a harmonic oscillator, like a mass on a spring. And it's surprising to me that it works so well because a mass on a spring is a physical object uh, that, that you can see. It's in bulk. You know, it's, it's large enough to touch and, and hold in your hands. And yet that math still works for these uh, atoms that behave like waves. So that's bizarre that that works, but it does. So the harmonic oscillator is a good example of a, of a classical physics problem that is directly applicable to quantum mechanics. So there are some some funny business that goes on, but for the, as far as the math and, and the frequency and the mass and all of those things, the way they interact is just like a mass on a spring. So this talk a little bit about vibrational motions and the harmonic oscillator model, again, using Hooke's law for that potential energy surface. Uh, the force constant is sort of the tightness of that spring. I call it a restoring force. You have an equilibrium position represented by RE. We think of it as stretching, but it also applies to bending. So you have this equilibrium bond length, and if you distort that bond length, there's a restoring force that pushes it back, and that's the force constant. Okay. If you have a really tight force constant, you have a steep potential, and if you have a really flimsy force constant, you have a really weak and flat potential with lots of motion. So a uh, low frequency would have a low force constant and a high frequency would have a really uh, large force constant. And so you end up with this parabolic potential energy surface curve. And then polyatomic vibrational motions, how we get those arrow diagrams and so on are using the projection operator. And there's a video associated with that on YouTube. I'm not exactly sure <laughs> if we're gonna do that lecture uh, in this course, it's more of an information on where the arrows come from. So if that's something that you're curious about, you can you can uh, find that video on YouTube. Just peek him, peek him at Sam. You can type that into YouTube and you could say um, projection operator and you'll get it. It's, it's like the most esoteric application of this material. And yet that's my most popular video. It's like got the most views worldwide. So that's kind of funny. I think that's because it's a difficult topic. And so when people are going on to YouTube to understand the most difficult topic, that's what they type in is projection operator and they get that video. And I don't know of any other videos on there that to talk through that. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in the last fifth of the course. And so these motions for in the molecule are called normal modes of vibration. Their wave functions are normalized and they're orthogonal to each other. So uh, this was the first time in vibrational spectroscopy that I ever got comfortable thinking in multiple dim dimensions greater than three. Okay, we're, we're pretty used to dealing with Cartesian coordinates, right? X, Y, and Z, three coordinates. Uh, maybe a fourth dimension of time, right? So sometimes you see the theaters, 4D, you know, like, what's 4D? Well, it's a motion picture, so that's time. And then you have the 3D glasses. Okay, so that's really four dimensional movie that's going on. It'd be really boring if it was just 3D because it'd be a single picture. <laughs> you can look at it and go, ooh, that's cool, but then you're, you're done. You know? So the fourth dimension is what makes it interesting is that, that time element. It's animated. Okay. So, uh, but for normal modes of vibration, think about the dimensions that we have. We have three N minus six dimensions. So however many atoms you have, they can all move in X, Y, and Z. And there's three n of those, so there's three n total degrees of freedom. So you can move in the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction. Those are translations, and so we subtract those out of the total because they're not vibrations. And then we have rotation, so we have rotation around x and y, and that's all you have for a linear molecule because you can rotate around x, you can rotate around y, but there's no defined rotation around z because there's no mass off of that axis. If you do have a nonlinear molecule, then you have a rotation around Z. So you have three rotations. And, and so that's not a vibration. So we subtract that. And that's where the minus six comes from. So we're taking away the three translations. We're taking away the three rotations and the rest are vibrations. So in a big molecule, a nonlinear molecule, you have three N minus six vibrations and they're all independent. So those are all independent orthogonal axes, if you will kind of like X, Y, and Z, 
but they're not 90 degrees to each other. They're just independent of each other. And I never could get my mind around that multidimensional space until I started thinking about my own hands and feet and legs. I can move this finger back and forth without moving my pinky. So those are independent axes. They're orthogonal to each other. And so here I have 10 dimensions that I can put in different quantum states. And so right there, I can think in 10 dimensional space. So that's pretty cool. Like after today, you can say, what did y'all do in PQ? I can say, well, I learned how to think in 10 dimensional space. <laughs> okay, because I can put a number on every one of my fingers. I can say that this is the ground state and this is the first excited state. So my thumb is in its first excited state, but all my other fingers are in the ground state. And now this finger's in its first excited state and it's oscillating, I don't know why. Okay, but, but, um, but now I've got, I've got this quantum set. I've got zero, 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 one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero. So if I were to describe this system, I could use ones and zeros, quantum numbers. If I would like really crank it up, maybe move it to the third excited state, I go zero, 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 zero two, zero, zero, one, zero, zero. So you have three N minus six quantum numbers to describe a particular vibrational condition for a molecule. So it can get really confusing, but it's at least understandable. I could have my arm oscillating and my leg bending at the same time. Okay, and so those are um, independent of each other. Okay, and if they're the same frequency, they couple. And so you can have things like if your arms are stretching, you can have the symmetric stretch or the asymmetric stretch. Okay, and you can couple that to the bending mode. And there are different frequencies, okay? And so you have this n-dimensional space in a molecule. You can do it to the rock, too. This is the rock. See, it's rocking, okay? This is wagging, okay? So you can have the wag and the rock going at the same time, okay? And I'm making a music video, okay, to do a leap, get physical, you know, so we're really going to put this to music. I, I can't wait because it's physical chemistry, right? So, so I'm getting all these dance moves on the thing. Um, so you have all of those independent motions. Uh, Marie, had a question? I did. So you're using the term uh, quantum state and translation interchangeably, right? Not translation. So translation is the whole thing moving in one direction or the other. And that's what I thought, but um, I wrote down, uh, you said three and minus six translations. I misspoke then, it's vibrations. Okay. Yeah, three and minus six vibrations. Yeah, sorry. I do that occasionally, so catch me. Okay. And so when you're thinking of the molecule, we will typically show the arrows for one vibrational motion, but they're all on that molecule and they're all going at the same time. So it can really be crazy. Water's doing the symmetric stretch, asymmetric stretch and bending at the same time. Okay, and then there may be some symmetric stretch thrown in there. So they may be looking like this and bending. So if you were to look at a, at a molecule in space, it would just be like crazy, spastic. But you could take all of those independent wave functions and break them apart because they're all independent of each other. If you could, um, like turn on a strobe light and capture the frequency of just the symmetric stretch, then you would isolate it and you would see that it's by itself. And if you could turn on a strobe light to the bending motion and capture its frequency, it would have a particular frequency. And so that would really be cool if we could see molecules, we could dial in a strobe light and see the motion that we're looking at and they would all have different frequencies because they all have different masses that are moving and they all have different force constants. And so they all show up at different places in the spectrum. So that's, that's, I mean, mostly, sometimes they're degenerate. They just happen to coincidentally land on top of each other. But, but in general, all of these different frequencies move different amounts of mass, have different spring constants. And so they show up at different frequencies. And here's the frequency equation. We'll screw, zoom in here on the, the parabolic, uh, like at the bottom where the anharmonic potential and the harmonic potential merge. And this is what we see for the wave functions. Now, this is, I'll, I'll only talk about the funny business here just for a little bit, because I don't want to confuse people about interpreting the wave function, because we really don't do that very much. But, but notice a few things about this. This is the energy level diagram. So here's our energy equation. Our quantum number is V. 
So that's the quantum number right there. Uh, v is quantum number. And then I'm, I'm just sorry, but this is a Greek character that looks like a V, but it's not. It's new. Okay. It's the vibrational frequency in inverse centimeters. So it's wave numbers. If we were to plot this on a like a meter stick and zoom in, it would have so many waves per centimeter. That's what wave numbers mean. So how many times it goes up and down in a given centimeter. So it's related to um, it's related to the wavelength, but it's inverse wavelength. So let's see. So when wave, wavelength is in centimeters, you invert that and you get wave numbers, okay? Um, it is proportional to um, frequency. I can't find my pen today. Okay, there it is. So do you see that little tilde we're putting on top? That tilde indicates that that's the frequency in wave numbers. So um, if we were to write this in energy, energy is equal to h nu, which is equal to h c over lambda, which is equal to h nu tilde. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, h c nu tilde. I'm left off the c. Okay, so just showing you, again, some of the equations related to wave numbers. These are very um, important wave, uh, equations if you ever need to get to energy from wave number. You just multiply by uh, Planck's constant and the speed of light in uh, centimeters per second, not in meters per second, so that they can't, the units cancel. Okay. So with this energy equation, you can see that V equals zero is here. Notice if I increase the quantum number by one, I just get one more unit of the vibrational frequency. So that's V equals one. If I go to V equals two, V equals three, and so on, the, the main thing that we see is that it's equally spaced in the vibrational quantum number. Another thing we see that from the, from the particle in a box, if you remember that one, we had steep walls. They went straight up and then the potential was zero in the middle and the wave function went to zero right at the wall. Because if it was going to penetrate the wall, uh, the wall had infinite potential energy. And so the particle couldn't penetrate the wall without having an infinite amount of energy. Whereas this potential goes up more gradually. You see, this is a, a parabolic curve. And so because the, the potential um, goes up gradually, the the wave function penetrates the wall a little bit. Okay, so there's some small chance that the particle will be what we call outside the box because the box walls are smooth, they go up gradually. Okay, um, where do you find the particle? Well, we square the wave function, right? And so if you are, um, if you're a marksman and this is a carnival game and you want to hit the particle <laughs> as it's vibrating, if it's in the ground state and you square this wave function, the particle is most likely around the zero point. You see that? Because that's where the that's where the wave function is its largest. Okay. If you're at a carnival game and it's not a quantum particle, but it's an actual pendulum, where is it easiest to hit the target? In the very center when it's moving really fast, or at the edges where it's turning around and it's stationary? at the edges. So this is the one the one thing about vibrational motion that's peculiar that is sort of non-classical is that in the quantum vibration the particle spends most of its time or it's most probably found around the equilibrium bond length so at zero at the minimum. But in a classical system where you have a pendulum on a on a on a on a rope 
it's going to spend most of its time at the turning points. And so that's, that's where this sort of differs, the quantum particles. So if you're at a quantum carnival, <laughs> you shoot at the bottom of the, of the pendulum and you're going to hit the particle. If you're at a classical carnival, which is the only one you can really be at, you, you shoot at the turning points. When that particle's out there and it's stopped, you can hit it. What's interesting is, is when you square these wave functions down here, the ground state, that's going to be the most quantum state there is, is the ground state. But as you go higher in quantum number, you start to approach the classical limit. And look what this, these amplitudes over here start to get larger at the turning points if you go up in, in quantum number. So that's pretty cool. As you, as you increase the quantum excitation, the system starts to behave like a classical system. If you reduce the quantum excitation, it starts to behave like a quantum system. And we see this in all of our systems. Uh, we saw this in the particle in a box, although I didn't really point it out to you. But you can go back there and see that the, the ground state is the least classical. And the super excited states are the most classical. By classical, I mean your regular physics, um, F equals MA type stuff, um, where you can find uh, the particle like a particle in a box. If it's in the box, you would think there would be an equal probable a chance of finding the particle anywhere in the box. That's your classical statistics. Quantum statistics says that ground state wave function says it's in the middle most of the time and at the edge is almost no time. Okay. The same here in the vibrational motion, in the quantum, in the lowest possible quantum state, it spends most of its time in the middle. And in the classical system, it spends most of its time at the turning points. And it's a smooth transition. There is no point at which it snaps and goes to quantum from classical. It's very smooth. Over here we have symmetry, just like in the 1D particle in a box. We start out with an even wave function in the ground state, then odd. Can you see the wave functions and see the even and odd nature? And then even and odd, whether they have a mirror plane essentially in the middle, and the left looks like the right, or the left is the opposite sign of the right. That's how you would determine whether it's even or odd. And so this determines our selection rules. Since light is odd, we can't go from an even level to an even level because light ruins it, right? It, it ruins our transition dipole moment. We have the integral over all space of an odd function, and that's zero. But we could go from an even to an odd state because light is odd. And so this would be non-zero. So we can just look at this and immediately know our selection rules are at least plus or minus one and probably plus or minus three and plus or minus five, so I could go all the way from this even level up here to this odd level, and that would be allowed as well. And we did that without any of the math. Believe me, the math for the harmonic oscillator is 10 times worse than the, than the particle in a box. <laughs> I've never done it. I've never done the wave function transition dipole moment integral for harmonic oscillator. In fact, very few people have done that for the particle in a box. You guys have done it. And the reason I say very few people is I've looked, my grad student looked all over the literature in all of the PCHEM textbooks. It's nowhere to be found. That calculus assignment that y'all did, and that's why I'm writing my book. Because that assignment I think is valuable, you may differ, but that assignment I think <laughs> is valuable. And you can see all of the math of spectroscopy in one dimension, and you can do it yourself. And then you can appreciate symmetry and how much easier it is. And so let's look at this region here where they diverge, okay? So the parabolic uh, potential energy surface and the more real um, inharmonic potential energy surface diverge from each other. And that's where we have bond dissociation. So this would be the bond energy for the molecule. Okay, so those are dissociation energies and they're either uh, DE or D0. DE is from the bottom of that potential well but we have this uh, zero point energy. E is equal to H C nu tilde times V plus one half. So this plus one half business gives us what we call zero point energy. When V equals zero, the energy is equal to one half H C nu. OK. 
Okay, so half of your vibrational frequency is the zero point energy. So if I have a, in water, my bending motion is a is a hat is a fifteen hundred wave numbers, and so then my zero point energy for that motion would be seven hundred and fifty wave numbers. I can't get that energy out of the molecule. It's kind of strange that even in the ground state, the molecules are still moving. We can't we can't cool them down below that ground state. There's a this zero point energy that's that's part of nature. Strange. Yes. So the the the, the character with the tilde over it, that is new. Yes. But the character inside the parentheses, that's a D. Yes. Okay. Yes, right. very, very that's tricky. I, I realize that's very tricky. I didn't do it. <laughs> it's just the way the the, the traditional well, so it's yeah. drawn in yeah. the in the type too. Yeah, it's, it's exactly the, the font so looks exactly the same in PowerPoint and I don't know why. Um so yeah. Yeah, equation editor is not our friend in that particular case because it makes that V look just like the new. Okay. And so then this DE value, I'm not exactly sure of its utility. There's a few times when it might come into play, but D0 is the true dissociation energy because that's going from the ground state, the V equals zero state to dissociation. Okay. And so if we think of this as like a chlorine and a hydrogen bond, you know, this is that hydrogen bond being hydrogen being pulled all the way off the molecule. And so at, uh, at this particular um, vibrational state, the chlorine, the hydrogen can be this close or this far. And it's oscillating between those two. Makes sense. And so that uh, it's it's coming in really close and bouncing out, and then spending a lot of time away from the molecule. So it's doing this at that high excited, excitation state, spending a lot of time away from the molecule, and then eventually, if I excite it even more, it just goes in, and then it just never comes back. <laughs> it's like I don't know. Hydrogen was here one day, and then. Went out for a drink and never came back. <laughs> so, but down here at the bottom in the ground state, that hydrogen is just cruising back and forth, and and it's nice, happy equilibrium bond length, and has one half of its vibrational frequency as its zero point energy. So here are all the sort of a summary of all the equations for our harmonic oscillator. We have the energy equation at the top. The frequencies are governed by the force constant here and the reduced mass. So K is the force constant. The units of that are newtons per meter. And then uh, mu is the reduced mass. And for a diatomic molecule, the reduced mass is pretty easy. Um, there's a sort of universal definition of reduced mass. Uh, let's see if I can remember it. Yeah, yeah, it's one over is equal to the sum of all the masses of one over m i. So it's a really ugly equation because it's one over mu is equal to the sum of one over all of the others. And, and so if you just have two masses, then you have that sum of two mass uh, fractions and then you can solve for mu and that's the equation that you get. So. And then to calculate for that anharmonicity, so these energy levels up here the ones that get closer and closer together, see right here, they get closer and closer together. Uh, we need to add in some correction terms to our energy. And that's called anharmonicity. So a harmonic oscillator is your regular energy equation up here. The harmonic oscillator energies, see here, harmonic oscillator. Uh, this is the energy equation. And so if we want to make it not harmonic, we put an an in front of it. So it's anharmonicity. It's an anharmonic system and we subtract this term. This is a typical polynomial fit, okay? So we just add in a squared term and subtract it, and that typically, when the, when the quantum number gets too high, is subtracting too much, and so then we add in a plus term cubed, and then you could even go minus a term to the fourth power and plus a term to the fifth power. Those are just called higher order terms. So there's nothing really, um, special about this anharmonic correction. It's just a polynomial fit to, to match how those energy levels get smaller and smaller 
uh, the differences get smaller and smaller. Uh, we will actually solve for these uh, in uh, iodine in the I2 lab. So you'll solve for these anharmonic um, potential um, terms because we're doing a visible spectrum and so we have lots of transitions from this vibrational level to vibrational levels in the excited state and you can you can solve for these by fitting them to this polynomial. So that's the last lab in this course. So we're built up to it. Uh, here's some of the molecular constants for diatomics. So we have the vibrational frequencies up here. Now, if you want, just for your for your help, I put in the units of everything here. So energy is in joules. Planck's constant is in joules seconds. So that's H. Uh, in terms of the vibrational frequency, this is new tilde, it's in wave numbers. And so we have to make the speed of light compatible with that. And so this is the speed of light in centimeters per second. So instead of three times 10 to the eight meters per second, it's three times 10 to the 10 centimeters per second. Okay, so three times 10 to the 10 centimeters per second. You know, it's two order magnitude higher because the unit is two orders of magnitude smaller. So, so light's pretty fast. Um, over here we have the vibrational frequency in, uh, in this force constant here. And then uh, we have, it's in newtons per meter. So this is a newton, this is a per meter, and that's a mass on the bottom in kilograms. So here's all of our units. So here's a, you know, you know, a newton is the, um, let's see, it's not quite the force of gravity on one kilogram, but you can think of it that way. So, you know, like a um, couple of pounds, this doesn't quite weigh two pounds, maybe, maybe this. Okay. So that's, I'll just tell you that's two pounds. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, a, a, a Newton is pretty close to the force I'm feeling from gravity. And so that's not too hard, but look at the, the force on, the, on holding the hydrogen molecule together, 575 Newtons per meter. Now that, that would be how many Newtons I have to put on that hydrogen to pull it apart one meter. So it's a lot of force, okay? So these covalent bonds are really tight. That's why it takes a fair amount of energy to pull them apart. Um, you've got some stronger bonds here like HF, uh, nitrogen, a triple bond, look at that, 2295. So much easier to pull apart a hydrogen than a nitrogen. And that's a good thing because our atmosphere is 80% nitrogen and it's not very reactive because it's got that strong covalent bond. So we can breathe it in and out every day and it doesn't do anything to our bodies. We have it dissolved in our, in our bloodstream and everything and uh, it's non-reactive. So that's a, that's a great thing. We would die, I'm sure, if, if uh, nitrogen were as reactive as oxygen. Okay, look at oxygen, half, it's 1100. Okay, okay so this is a little bit of that. Uh, now, rotational constants we'll get into next time. So we're doing vibrations now. Um, next week, it will start getting into rotations, uh, but here's the units for the rotational constant. And here's the bond dissociation energies here too. So again, that nitrogen bond dissociation energy, 945 kilojoules per mole, oxygen's only around 500. The force constants. Now, sometimes you'll see uh, the the um, force constants written in millinewtons per meter. So instead of newtons per meter, there'll be millinewtons per meter. Now that's that's really confusing because it's got an m and an m. <laughs> really confusing, right? You look at that and you go, "Why didn't you cancel the meters?" Right? It looks like a newton to me, but that first m, the top m, is a prefix. That's a millinewton per meter. That's crazy, isn't it? So sometimes instead of writing millinewtons per meter, they'll use the dynes per centimeter. Now, what on earth is a dyne? Okay, uh, you know you've maybe heard of uh, these dynameters. You put a fast car, a truck, on a dynameter. You're measuring the the force that it can deliver from the back wheels. It's measuring force. So a dyne is a force, but it's in what we call the CGS system. So there's two different systems of SI units. 
we typically use the MKS system, which is meter, kilogram, second, MKS. But the CGS system is also useful. Uh, sometimes we, we slip into that, and that's the centimeter, gram, second. So the, the units of distance are centimeters, mass is grams, and time is seconds. So we don't have any other units for time, but we do have distance differences. Sometimes we use centimeters as our base unit. Sometimes we use meters for our base unit. Sometimes we use kilograms. Sometimes we use grams. And they have different names. So the N is a Newton. In, in the MKS system, that's the force. The force in the CGS system is a dime. And there's no like single letter for it either, which is also annoying. Um, so um, it's kind of breaking the ACS rules, right? Your, your, your variables should have a single letter and you can use subscripts and superscripts and so on. But in the CGS system, they spell out dime and they shouldn't do that, but that's what they do. Um, and so here's all of the different units in converting Newtons per meter to dimes per centimeter. So we have a Newton is a kilogram meters per second squared, and if it's per meter, is a meter on bottom. So we convert kilograms to grams, and we can, and a dyne is a gram per, uh, gram centimeter per second squared. Uh, we can cancel the meters, we can cancel the centimeters, we can cancel that meter with this meter converting over to centimeters, and then the per seconds cancel. And so a Newton per meter is equal to 10 to the minus Oh, we can cancel that too. 10 to the minus 2 is cancel. Is equal to a dyne per centimeter. Okay, times 10 to the 3. So this 10 to the 3 didn't cancel. So, if we bring this 10 to the 3 over to the other side, it's 10 to the minus 3, which is milli. And the only reason I do this is because some tables will list their force constants and Milli, milli newtons per meter and you go into Gaussian and you look at the Gaussian output and the force constants dynes per centimeter and this allows you to convert back and forth okay so this is just put a star on this slide and talk say force constant well it says force constants on the top so anytime you're dealing with the units of force constants come back here and and you can um, hack your way through the units most of this course if you'll notice on the problems is about units if you don't keep your units, you don't have any idea what you're doing. Okay. Let's talk about the vibrational transitions. So we have fundamentals. We have hot bands. Zero to one is the fundamental. In particle in a one-dimensional box, one to two was the fundamental. Okay, but now we have a quantum number zero. So the fundamental is zero to one. So put a star by that, because that's a new definition. Okay. okay, eyes up here, eyes up here. This test on this Friday is on the particle in a box. <laughs> okay, so the fundamental on Friday is from one to two. <laughs> All right, has everybody got that? Okay, <laughs> it's context, right? You got to know what the context is. Don't don't memorize fundamental is this. You got to know what the system you're talking about is. Fundamental for a particle in a box, the ground state is n equals one. The the ground state for vibration is v equals zero. It helps that the quantum number is even a different letter. Okay, so okay, but then anything above that is a hot band. Okay, so. And anharmonicity allows all of the quantum transitions. So we can go plus or minus two, plus or minus three, plus or minus four, because it breaks the symmetry. And so then we have all of these things allowed. The thing is though, the hot bands are right on top of the fundamental because we have the same spacing in our energy levels. And so you wouldn't know if you had a hot band or not, except that your peak gets a little taller. So then zero to two is the first overtone, zero to three is the second overtone and so on. Okay. Just a little bit about um, our samples in the lab. We can get infrared spectra from solids, liquids, and gases, but IR is very sensitive, so it, it be becomes opaque really quick. And, you know, in UV vis, your sample cuvettes are about a centimeter thick, so your path length is a centimeter. In infrared, your path length needs to be a few microns, so a few tenths of a millimeter. Okay, so um, 
Raman also has trouble with colored samples because it uses visible lasers and it if that sample absorbs the laser then it burns it catches on fire so we, that's that's pretty pretty dangerous um, and then uh, if it's a liquid you don't see the rotational structure if it's a solid you don't see the rotational structure so really you only get rotational structure from gases and uh, and so let's look at a comparison of the Raman and IR spectra of the same substance. So on the, on the left, let's talk about Raman. We have Rayleigh scattering on the left and Raman scattering on the right. We've talked about this before. We have Stokes scattered light where there's a, a red shift and uh, anti-Stokes where there's a blue shift. Um, here's some of the examples of, of spectra that we're going to look at in this course. We have the carbon monoxide spectrum that we're going to look at. So we will we will analyze and assign all these little quantum numbers, all, this, all those little peaks there, we will assign quantum numbers to every one of them. And then we'll use a linear regression in Excel and solve for the bond length of carbon monoxide. And this, let's see, where's the meter stick? Okay. This thing has uh, millimeter markings on here. So if I were using this, I could estimate to half a millimeter. Okay, so that would be, um, Five times, five times 10 to the minus four is the best I could do with this. Your uncertainty from that lab will be at least in the third decimal place, probably the fourth decimal place of angstroms. So your uncertainty in that lab for the bond length of carbon monoxide will be, let's just say, in, on the order of 10 to the minus 14 or 10 to the minus 15. That's incredible. So using spectroscopy to measure the distance between two atoms down to an uncertainty of 10 to the minus 14. So you're that sure. It's incredible. So I get really excited about it. And then the, the, you can see now when I was talking about my fingers and I had 10, 10 different quantum states. Well, in carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide, we have three vibrational states. There's really four vibrations, but uh, one of them is degenerate. So we have three quantum states. And these are the, the vibrational modes. So this C010, 001, 100. So those three quantum numbers are the different vibrational excitations. So this is, um, this is nu1, and it's Raman active only. This is nu2, and it's IR active. That's the bending mode, so it's down here at 600 wave numbers. And this is nu3, that's the asymmetric stretch, which is infrared active where we've looked at carbon monoxide, we're gonna discuss water, and then we have some other features up here that we'll learn about too. Here's the vibrations, at least of the stretches for CO2. And then here's the normal modes for water. Now what I have in here is some, the spectra for acetonitrile. Um, how many vibrational modes do we have for acetonitrile? So this was uh, a molecule on your last exam. So we have uh, three, four, five, six atoms. So three in, three times six is 18, minus six is 12. So we should have 12 vibrational motions. And I see eight, but this is two, this is two, this is two, and this is two. Because of that E symmetry, they're doubly degenerate. Okay. And so I have eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So I have all 12 right here. And then this is the vibrational spectrum. Notice they have different frequencies over here. And so here's the vibrational spectrum. I have the FTIR on top the Raman here in the middle, and then those stick spectra are from Gaussian. So Gaussian does pretty well. And so here's all of them. The, the, this low frequency bending mode of the whole molecule, it's doubly degenerate, so I'm showing you the X and Y directions, is way down there, new eight. It's, it's below what my infrared spectrometer can gather. It's just too low in your energy for my infrared spectrometer. But then this is new four. So that's the carbon-carbon stretch moving lots of mass, so it's in a low frequency region. This is nu7, that's a deformation of those hydrogens. Those hydrogens are really light, and so they're able to flip around pretty fast. This is nu3, that's the umbrella mode. You can kind of picture the umbrella in a windstorm getting 
sucked up. Okay. This is a new six, uh, another deformation of the hydrogens. It's the bending of the angles of those hydrogens between each other. This is new two. That's the, the nitrile stretch. So that carbon nitrogen, uh, it's pretty heavy masses, a nitrogen and a carbon are stretching, but it's a triple bond. So that high vibrational uh, force constant uh, causes it to go to a pretty high frequency. Um, and then here's the hydrogen stretch. The lightest atoms on the molecule are the hydrogens and, and they stretch really quickly, really fast. And then this is the asymmetric stretch of those hydrogens. Then we have some strange things called combination bands, new three plus new four and two new eight and so on, and we'll talk about later. We could do the same thing with benzene. These are the vibrational modes of benzene. So there should be 36 degrees of freedom. There's 12 atoms. Minus six, we have 30. And again, you add these up, the de doubly degenerate ones count twice. Okay, so there's 30. These are all 30 vibrational modes for benzene, all the different arrow diagrams. And you can animate these by following that link. So hopefully on the PDF notes, if you go on, open it up on your computer, you can click that link and you can see all of the vibrations. Or you could calculate benzene on Gaussian and animate the vibrations that way. Yeah. So, so you know, if you're looking at this, this is a little bit of review. Um, if you're looking at this vibrational motion, if it was just static, you'd have the arrows and you have the coordinate system. But now you can kind of see the motion. Compare it to that coordinate system and tell me what the Cartesian symmetry is of this vibration on the count of three. One, two, three. Y. Yeah, it's Y. Y'all waited for that guy to answer first. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, they know how they're moving. You see how they're moving in the Y direction. There's up and down too, but it kind of cancels. And so it's the it's the Y direction. If they were if the top was squeezing while the bottom was expanding, then it would be in the X direction. And so you know, get comfortable with that. We got five minutes for some Kahoot reviews. Okay. Sorry, it's just cruising through that as quickly as possible.